that's when I really woke up and said, you know, when I started this business, I got so busy working in the business. It's not that I was oblivious to growth. I mean, I've been growth minded my whole life until I started my own business. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. Every week, I bring you the latest scoop on what these incredible people do to succeed and how you can get their secrets and do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you support the show on Patreon. You get some exclusive and fun bonuses. Go to patreon.com slash innovative mindset and join in. And now let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am super, super thrilled you're here. I've got to tell you, I'm also really thrilled to welcome this week's guest. And that's in part because I know almost nothing about what it is that he does. Not that I don't know what he does. <laughs> I know it's funny, isn't it? But I, the the actual topics that he talks about and he's an expert on is something that's been a mystery to me. So I'm super excited to welcome Jim Adams to the show. Jim is a speaker, online educator, and financial management consultant for small and family owned businesses. Now you understand why. <laughs> I'm so excited to have him on here. Nowadays, you're going to find him traveling the country in his RV, and he just had an eight-day vacation. Are you jealous? I'm totally jealous. He's speaking at virtual events, and he's looking for the muddiest, scariest obstacle course race he can find, all while serving his clients and facilitating his Profit Speak online interactive workshops. Jim left his job as a full-time 100% travel consultant to get his life back while better serving small business owners. How awesome is that? His goal is to help you get your business on stage by helping you be able to better drive your business using your numbers. Welcome, Jim. I'm so glad that you're here. Yeah, so awesome to be here. This is so great. So, okay, I, I frankly admit, no, it's not that numbers scare me. I'm not terrible at math or arithmetic. It's that I find what numbers you need to keep track of as a business owner, as somebody who's an entrepreneur, I find that all very confusing. So when you talk about knowing your numbers or using your numbers what does it mean to use your numbers what numbers are we talking about how does a business owner use them well obviously it depends on what kind of business that you have so most of my clients are like brick and mortar kind of businesses they they make things they build things they install things they have laborers they have materials that they're dealing with and so <clears throat> But some of the same principles apply to like an online business, a content marketing business, a creative business. And that is, is that you need to know what it is that you're selling. You need to know things like what's the average value of a client or the average value of a job. Um, you need to know a list of what I call metrics. There's a, a term that's used frequently called key performance indicators. That's too many syllables for me. So I just use the word metrics. And so the most powerful thing that you can do right now today is to outline what your metrics are for your business. Um, and the reason why I say today is because financial statements that like scare the bejesus out of most people and are mm -hmm. even challenging for me, um, you know, as an expert in financial management, um, financial statements are very challenging. Mm -hmm. And so most businesses, their financial statements, many businesses, I should say, their financial statements are mucked up and or not very useful. And so metrics, on the other hand, um, like, for example, if you have an online business, it's, uh, you know, how much, how many visitors do you have? How many people are contacting you of the people that are contacting you? How many people are spending money with you and so on and so forth, all the way down to your bottom line revenue. Um, but one most important number that everybody forgets, and that is profit. And so what profit ends up being in most small businesses, and it's, and it's right there on the bottom of your financial statement, okay, where it does not belong, and that is profit. So they put profit on the bottom of the financial statement, and it really, really should be at the top. Like when you start a business, you're going to put your heart, soul, you might be mortgaging your home for that business, um, you're going to put everything that you have into that business and getting it off the ground. You need to know what profit that you're going to make and then work towards that. Okay. 
that I love I love what you just said and I think it's great and there were so many things that you said that I'm like ah, I don't get it okay let's let's start basic very small when you say profit do you mean what your business can make do you mean what you get to take home in your pocket at the end of the week what does profit mean yes okay so that's a great question um, it's basically the money that you're able to spend okay. um, after all the expenses your cost of sales all the expenses of the business have have been met um, and I say it's what's left over but it it's a number that needs to be planned for so if you your year if you want to have um, sixty thousand dollars to meet your expenses and that's your goal which that's fine starting a business is for your goal to be able to make enough money to pay your expenses mm -hmm. or if you're transitioning let's say you're um you're in a job now mm -hmm. and you have a side hustle and you want to let's say make thirty thousand dollars so um it just depends like what that is. It depends on what the inputs and the outputs are. So a lot of businesses out there have very, very little overhead and very few expenses. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, like my business, the, uh, you know, the cost of sales is about 70, 75%. So it just, uh... anyway, so it's the money, it's the money that is left after you paid all of your expenses and cost of goods. Okay. And that includes, let's say you have employees that's paying their salaries, that's, or, or virtual assistant, let's say for, if you're a small business owner, let's say you have a, one assistant or a virtual assistant. So all of that is all of that money that you would be paying them, that you would be paying in taxes and all of that, 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 that doesn't count towards what profit is, correct? Right. That profit, let me, I make it very simple. Okay. That profit is yours. That's what makes it so important. It's <laughs> yeah. yours. It doesn't belong to the IRS. It doesn't belong to your employees. It doesn't belong to your vendors. It doesn't belong to your music supply store in your in your case, you know, or your manager. That is is old as money. That's mm -hmm. your money. Mm -hmm. You can keep and spend and use as you wish. That's your money. Okay. So if if you're a creative person how do you figure that out you said you want to this is the number you want to work for and mm -hmm. i'm really fascinated by this because as you can tell i i know i know barely the basics about it so if you say you want to work for it how do you decide what what it, what is the process of deciding what profit you want to make and also what profit you think you can make like what if you want to make a profit of sixty thousand dollars but the business you're in or the way you're doing it might only make you a profit of four hundred and twenty seven dollars I mean you know what I mean so mm -hmm. how do you how do you plan for that how do you decide that and then how do you work for it well let me start off at the very very beginning and Yay. that is is that most people don't even set aside the time to actually think about it mm -hmm. because I know you're a very intelligent woman I've you know read some of your materials I've you know listened to some of your podcasts obviously a very, very intelligent woman. If you took the time to actually think about some of these things and how much you get paid to do a job, how much you get paid for a, uh, a speaking, you know, I know you've done some work for NASA and things like that, how much you get paid for one of those visits. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you put those. So in, in that area, it's what are the different type things that you do? So if you go do a gig at a coffee house, Mm -hmm. you know, where it's you and your guitar. So that might pay $500. Oh, I wish. <laughs> okay. I have go no on. idea. I have no idea. Yeah, it'll be $28 in tips, but go on. <laughs> okay. Okay. And you know, that's a very important thing is that to be honest with yourself, mm -hmm. is that, is this a business or is this a hobby? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's nothing wrong with having a hobby. Okay. If someone has the income and let's say somebody, you know, wants to do, let's just say coaching, for instance, and they just really want to give and, you know, they want to have somebody to meet their expenses and it's really just a hobby. If they're honest with themselves about that, that's fine. The problem is, is that if they're thinking that it's a business, but they're not taking the time to think about how many different events that they're going to do, mm 
how many jobs that they're going to do, um, how many, um, you know, in your case, speaking engagements that you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not start taking the time to think about that, then what you have is a hobby, not a business. Okay. That makes sense. Oh, it does. Absolutely. And so, for example, I love, I love that we're talking about this because this is something creative people on the whole, I think need to know more about. We, uh, we tend to, I think, throw things up in the air and go, I'm going to grab something and run with it. And that's not necessarily, or according to you, of course, since you're an expert on it, it's not the way to go about having a business. So, so if I were going to, uh, you know, and I don't play coffee houses nowadays, of course, because of COVID, but also because my guitar is heavy. So, uh, let's say I'm, I'm working at this and I'm deciding it's going to be a business. What is the first thing that I need to do? Like you said, we need to know our metrics, but I, I don't know even like you said, profit is important, but there are probably so many other things in addition to how many clients I might have, how many, uh, how many speaking gigs I might take, how many coaching clients I might, I might need or want in order to make my, my business work and my business be a business. Where do I begin? What is the first step that I need to do? to take once I've decided this is no longer a hobby. I want it to be a business. Now what? Okay. So you've already started down the right path and you're starting to think. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like one of your paintings, your beautiful paintings that you do, like you would, for you to create that painting, you have to set aside some time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so a business of any kind, Mm -hmm. whether it's Microsoft, or whether it's somebody that's um, playing a guitar or somebody that's selling artwork um, is, is creative. It's a creative process. Mm-hmm. And so sure. the, one of the first fundamental questions is who are your clients and what it is, are, what is it that you're selling? What are the different products that you're selling? So for example, a, <clears throat> a, uh, a coach, has got some different things that they sell. They sell their time, right? Where they're selling an hour for X amount of dollars. They have uh, group events where they're gonna do group training of 12 people, of four sessions, and it's gonna be $497. And they have um, speaking events where they might, you know, work their way up, you know, from $1,500 to $5,000 to $10,000 you know, as their career progresses, um, you know, they have masterminds, different things like this. And so each one of these different um, products, if you will, or services, Mm -hmm. when you get started, they each, they each have a dollar value. And so just to list out um, each of those things and, and, you know, month by month, if you're just getting started or wherever your point is that you're doing your planning month by month or quarter by quarter, how many of these, each of these are you planning on doing? And then you can add it all up. And so you can work both ends towards the middle. You can say, okay, this year I'm, I'm already quitting my job. And so this year my goal is I want to make um, $60,000 in revenue and I'm going to spend $10,000 in expenses. And I've got that outline and I want to end up with $50,000. And so what, what work do I have to do to meet that number. Okay. You can also start back the beginning and say, I want to do these many of this many of these different type products and services. And that adds up to X amount of dollars and you can play around with that. And it takes some time and have a creative process to work both ends towards the middle. And what you can find out is that maybe there's a lot more potential than you realized is one possibility. Another possibility that a lot of people find out is, is, oh, this is going to take a lot longer than I thought, or this is going to be a lot more work than I thought. Interesting. Okay. I love what you just said, that you have to plan either what you want to do or how much you want to make for the next Mm -hmm. year or for for however long. How do you find out uh, if people want what you do 
so that you can get those numbers. What what do you need to do as a business owner? Or do you do you need to do market research? Do you need to like sit people down and go, hey, I want to brainstorm with you? What are the what's the process for doing that? Like you were a management consultant, so you were working with companies or businesses that were already established or establishing themselves. Uh, how did you help them grow their businesses when they were new, when they were just getting started? Yeah, so actually I didn't. I did not work with startups. Oh, okay. And I okay. really I really don't. And so I meet some and in my travels, I meet a lot of people that are new and we and we do have we do have conversations. Um I would say um with a lot of people that are trying to start a side hustle is like where do you have gain? Like what, what is your background? What is it that people are going to pay you for mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what's your experience and, and what's the payoff for that? So if you have this coaching session with them or, or whatever it is, or they go to your mastermind, um, what's going to be the value to them? What problems are you, are you helping people solve? Uh, and so that's a, that's a really, that's where it really starts is what is the problem that's in the market? Who have you talked to? that um, you've determined that that's a problem that needs to be solved. And I can tell you the opposite from personal experience. So mm -hmm. I have not always done this successfully. I came up with this brainchild. I want to say it was three years ago when it started. So I have a, I have a, a, a business called American Landscape Structures. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've been bumping along doing, you know, between a million and two million a year for a number of years. And so I thought, well, it would be just great if people could actually see what one of these pavilions was going to look like in their backyard. And I actually found a company that could do this for me. Um, I don't remember if I contacted them or they contacted me, um, any like exterior or building product company, whether it's paint or siding or roofing, they hire this company to, to help visualize their products, or it could be deck material or, or pavers or, or things like that, home improvement. Mm -hmm. um, they hire this company to visualize their product. And so I hired them. I had it in my head that they were going to, the customer was going to be able to see this pavilion in their backyard and that this was going to be something that was just going to just double my business, that it was going to be huge, that there was a tremendous demand for this, that people were going to love it. Well, guess what? I didn't really ask a lot of people it was just my idea. It sounded really cool to me. I didn't really ask a lot of people what the effect was going to be. And mm -hmm. so it, uh, I'm not embarrassed anymore. I'm over it. It was $32,000 investment mm -hmm. and it was total crickets. Really? Total crickets. I thought it was just like the coolest thing since sliced bread and it was a flop. I ended up walking away from it. Hmm. So if you are... Um, don't quit your day job <laughs> until you have talked to some people that have validated, uh, you know, that have validated what it is that you want to do. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, pour water on anybody's dreams or desires. That's the last thing I want to do, but, but do, you know, do make sure that there is a, a demand for what you do. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I did and you did as well is, you know, we developed a professional network of people that, that have businesses that we can ask questions that can speak wisdom into our lives. You know, one of the things that I was suffering from um, when I made that decision is it's called smartest guy in the room syndrome. Hmm. I don't know if you've heard that before, but I've heard it. Absolutely. I'm a total yeah, I know it all, have, whether or not I deserve to be. <laughs> right. Right. And so I didn't, I did not, I was isolated. I didn't have people around me. Uh, it really wasn't an ego thing. It was just really just happened by default. Um, you know, when I went into business for myself, I didn't have people around me to speak into me that like each had their own area of expertise. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I didn't validate that. Uh, I didn't validate that decision. So. Um, Lesson learned, yeah, that, right? Right. Yeah. It, it's so interesting. I mean, figuring it, it, we're, we're living in kind of a different world than we used to, I think. And so much of it is nowadays, you know, what, not only what will the market bear, but it seems like it's, what are people interested in? And that changes, you know, it's what people are interested in is very, very different than they were 
20 years ago. And it's funny, this idea of visualizing a, a structure in the backyard, there are all of these apps that let you like, you can visualize what your hair would look like with this color hair if you wanted to change it. Or these glasses, you can put your face in the picture and it'll put the glasses on you so you can see what the glasses will look like. And yet for something like, you can see what this gazebo or this, this other landscape structure would look like in your backyard. For some reason, people weren't interested. So when you're in that space of trying to figure out how to proceed, it sounds like you're advocating talk to people. But what if the people you talk to, and this I suffer from this a little bit, I, I ask people for opinions and they go, I love it, I love it. And I'm like, no, 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 tear it apart because I know you like me and I know we're friends and I want you to be honest. And people are like, no, 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 really? And then of course there's crickets. So who would you recommend people talk to? Because friends and family aren't always the best because they they are sort of predisposed to love what you're doing, whether or not it's actually worth loving, if you see what I mean. So who are the people you should be reaching out to in order to find out whether or not, or like you said, validate your idea? Yeah, so the simple answer is successful people. Now I understand, <laughs> I you know, that can be that can be subjective, but um, you know, I'm I'm involved in a in a in a paid mastermind. And so I know if I ask these group of people a question, you know, they've achieved a level of success themselves. Mm -hmm. If you ask somebody a question and they've been an employee their whole lives and they've never really achieved anything, and um, you know, if you're striving to get to six figures or $200,000 a year, you want to talk to people that are making that or, or, you know, have checked that box already. Mm -hmm. um, because what will happen is that if you talk to people that have an employee mindset or a, a lesser mindset, they're going to answer your questions based on their own limiting beliefs. Mm. And whereas people that have broken that barrier, first of all, they know what a limiting belief is. Okay. What is you know, a that's limiting the first belief? thing. Um, well, a limiting belief is just any belief that limits you. I mean, and, and it's, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, um, you know, books out there and materials out there that have been written on that subject. Um, Psycho cybernetics is one. Um, another would be um, think and grow rich, things like that. So if you talk to, um, if you talk to people that have already, that are already where you want to be, they're going to have, cross that barrier mm -hmm. into that area of challenging whatever challenging and eradicating any limiting beliefs that they had that basically that any goal that they set for themselves that they can achieve it. Ah, that's, that's really cool. Okay. So then that was the first part, getting rid of limiting beliefs. And then what's the next part? What's the next part you should be looking at people who are, who have already achieved what you want to achieve. Is that the next thing you should be looking for? Uh, the other, yeah, people, people have achieved what you wanted to achieve. And the other is potential clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I had at my disposal, a list of thousands of, of, of prospects and, and about a thousand previous customers. I mean, I could have put a survey out there, but I, I was just convinced in my own head that this idea was a winner and I could have put that out there and, and gotten some more feedback and and done some testing and then you know the other it, it was just a i want to say the term is um and um i may not be able to answer your question if you ask me exactly what it is but there's a term called confirmation bias mm -hmm. and basically what it is is that you're just looking for information to confirm what you already believe you're not really open-minded to to really have mm -hmm. your beliefs challenged so right I think uh, that's where I was at that time. And so that's it. a definitely a trap to avoid. Oh, yeah. I, I think for for every single person in the world, confirmation bias is a problem that they could fall into uh, or mm -hmm. a trap, as you said. OK, so I love I love that you're what you're saying and I love how accessible you're making this. And I want to sort of go back a little bit about and talk a little bit about. First of all, I do want to talk about the the landscape structure business and how you made that just skyrocket. But I also would love to talk about your time as a management consultant. You left that work to start your own gig, if you will, your own business. Well, the questions I have are, what did you do as a management consultant? Since you weren't working with startups, you must have been working with bigger businesses. 
And what made you leave? What made you decide, you know what, it, it's time to do my own thing? Well, I'll answer the second question first because it's easier. It was 100% travel. Uh, and my wife and I were making the most of it to where, I mean, we'd be like peas and carrots on the weekends. But uh, <laughs> that's just not any kind of, it's just not sustainable. I did that for over four years mm. continuously. And that's just not sustainable. So, I mean, I was, I, I just absolutely love that work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, but, you know, even right when I got into it, I was looking for a way to get out and oh, the wow. way out for me was not to be an employee again. That was not what I wanted. I wanted to have my own business. Mm -hmm. And so, um, my wife and I wanted a structure for our own backyard in that process. We, uh, you know, we, we had a pretty decent marketing background. My wife and I had some success with another online business, um, where I had, you know, sold things on the phone before from online leads. And so, um, you know, we, we learned about this business up in Pennsylvania and, uh, and one thing led to another. And then the next thing, you know, we had a website, the original website was, uh, was Amish designers. And we had that going for a couple of years before we realized that wasn't really our, I, the right identity. And we created American landscape structures from that. Mm-hmm. And so you took that business from, from the, the sort of the model, I guess, from Pennsylvania, and then you've made, and, and especially this year during the pandemic, it skyrocketed. Can you tell me how that, what happened? How did that happen? Well, I'll give credit where credit's due. So the market definitely helped us, but um, I think the more, the more interesting part of the equation is that um, I going back to 2019, I was stuck myself. You know, I talk a lot about being stuck and I've been there. And so what I started on was uh, I was just uh, on a growth journey. So I read um, a John Maxwell book, 15 laws of growth. And my wife and I started going through that together. And so that really, and so that's when I really woke up and said, you know, when I started this business, I got so busy working in the business. It's not that I was oblivious to growth. I mean, I've been growth minded my whole life until I started my own business. <laughs> so huh. I basically became like my consulting clients and that I was so busy working in the business. I wasn't working on growth and learning anymore like I used to be. And so that year I just started on a whole new path. Um, I, you know, I up leveled the people that I was hanging out with, um, you know, in this case, virtually mostly. Um, you know, I went national, I, uh, I hired a coach, mm -hmm. you know, I hired the be best coach that I thought I could afford at that time to, uh, to challenge me and lead me and guide me and, and give me ideas. And, um, you know, I've continued to, you know, up level the people that, uh, that I spend time with that can speak into my life. And so what that led up to is the end of 2019, um, we started looking at our numbers again, you know, I, I became like my client. I wasn't really looking at my numbers why I know. And so I really picked apart and really dove into our metrics and said, you know, we're, you know, what knobs do we need to turn to double the business? And so I looked at those numbers and, and came to the conclusion that doubling the business was realistic. And so with not just the vision, but the actual hard numbers behind it, we made some changes, you know, we worked very, very hard on our sales conversation. So, you know, we're selling on the phone. So that sales conversation is absolutely critical. So I spent probably 50 hours in online sales training to help change our sales conversation. Another thing I did is I hired a copywriter to help me with a landing page and to do some testing. And so that process of testing you know, we just made some tweaks to our landing page that paid off in a major way. And then also I hired my first assistant, which I waited way too long to do that. And then I also um, hired a salesperson to help uh, carry the load because, I mean, I had just been doing everything myself, just crazy. I had tried hiring people before and just at that particular, like 2019, it was just me. And so anyway, all those things together. So we did a number of things proactively to grow the business. We set the goal of doubling the business. And then, and then in March, you know, our pipeline just evaporated. Right. And so that's where the story began of, 
of COVID. Wow. So I, I love that you were realistic about the numbers and I come back to what numbers, right? What were you looking at that you said we can double the business? What does doubling the business mean? Double the number of structures you put up, doubling your profit. What does all that mean? And how did you decide that you could double the business? So in our case, it was specifically doubling the sales. It was not doubling. It was not doubling the profit in this case, because we did, uh, we did drop our pricing down just a bit intentionally. Uh -huh. um, and, and we did the math on that. So, um, so we, we doubled our sales. And so the way that looks is we looked at the market, we figured the market was going to stay the same. Uh -huh. And so what our numbers look like is the amount of traffic that we have. We have, um, about a, we have about a thousand visitors a week right now. And so we look at the amount of traffic, the number of leads, the number of sales, the average dollar value of sale. And then you multiply all that out and you end up with the dollar of sales and then you got your gross profit margin and then underneath your gross profit margin, you got your expenses and then you got your uh, bottom line. And so, um, you know, that's, that's how we, those are the numbers that we looked at. We looked at the 2018 numbers. We looked at the 2019 numbers, and then we looked at the, uh, the, um, projected 2020 numbers in the, the really amazing thing about that is that if you get two of those numbers firing together, then you get a, you know, instead of like an addition effect, you get, you know, a multiplication effect. Mm. If you get two numbers that you, uh, that you can, uh, increase, then that's where you can have a, uh, a very dramatic effect. I know like one of the first things I would always go do, you know, going back to, you know, when I first started doing consulting in 1999, one of the very, very first things I would do is I would do an exercise with the client and I would ask them this question. I would say, so your, your profit for, um, I would have their financials and I'd say your profit for last year was $120,000. Right. And so this is a, you know, I'm looking right at their financials. And so if you knowing what you know about your numbers, if you grow your business by 10%, what's the impact going to be on your profit? And so most people would say, well, it's going to increase the profit by about 10%. Some people might say, well, 15 or 20%. And if you actually do the numbers, it's usually more often a 10% increase in business will usually more often yield a four, more closer to a 40% increase in profit. What? Wait, how? How does that work? So if you can, uh, if you can kind of follow along here, I've got uh -huh. an example, just picture a million dollar company. Okay. Okay. Now this is fictitious, but just to keep it simple, um, 30, 30, 30, 10. So that's 30% labor, 30% materials, 30% overhead and 10% profit. Okay. Okay. And so in a traditional example, most people right, wrong or different. Look at, if you just look at labor as being variable, and you look at materials as obviously being variable. So you got 60% there, 30 and 30. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then 30% overhead. So that overhead is fixed. You can fix that overhead by decisions, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's controllable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you take your million dollars and you increase your sales by a hundred thousand. Are you with me so far? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so your cost of sales is that 60%. Okay. So that's 60,000. Okay. And your increased gross profit, your sales minus your cost of sales is 40,000. You with me so far? Sure. Okay. And so 10% of a million is a hundred thousand, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just said your gross profit went up by 40,000. Now, this is a lot easier to understand, you know, with a whiteboard or a piece of paper and a pen or whatever, but, no, no, no. you know, I, as for, I for instead of listening on a podcast, but it is a very simple example. And so it's just really simple math, it's but so most people don't realize it. And so they're frustrated and they're overwhelmed and they think they have to just, you know, do all this effort and work to, uh, 
to, you know, dramatically increase their profit. And so that usually right there is just a very motivating conversation. It's so interesting that you say that because I think what was going on with me listening to the math and, and having to explain it is that I was going, okay, it wasn't that I was looking for it to be 40,000, which is 40% of the hundred thousand for profit. It, and, and I love, I love that I'm getting to arithmetic geek out here for a second. It's that I was actually thinking that it should be 400,000 because I was thinking that it should be a factor of the million dollars, which is the whole amount of money rather than just the profit, which is a hundred thousand. Do you see what I mean? That's why I was like, wait, what, how did that happen? So I can absolutely see the 40,000 because of how, because of how that worked. Because the hundred thousand is the profit from a million dollars that we started with, if if it's ten percent profit. But I think there is this mm -hmm. this uh, the psychology behind that is fascinating to me because all of a sudden I'm going, wait, it's my own preconceived notion of what you were talking about rather than the reality of what you were talking about. And I'm wondering, have you experienced that with other people you've talked to, people who maybe have a better grasp on these things or maybe not as good a grasp as I just displayed since I'm relatively new to looking at it this way? What what has what has happened to people? You said it's motivating, but have, have other people had misconceptions about what was possible when you were talking about this with them? Uh pretty much across the board of the clients that I met um, is that, so if you kind of think in terms of language, mm -hmm. okay, people can relate to language, you know, mm -hmm. and imagine yourself taking, I know you're multilingual, aren't you? Don't you know like five languages or something like that? Well, I'm not like, I took a year of Spanish in college and I'm being embarrassed to even try to speak Spanish in a Mexican restaurant. Um, <laughs> And so if you go to a foreign, if I go, not you, but if I go to a foreign country, it's a little bit intimidating. Um, you know, I would, I would try to learn as much as I can. I'd get some CDs or DVDs or whatever and try to learn, you know, to get, to be able to order food and, and get where I'm going and things like that. But it's still kind of intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so, um, you know, that's kind of where people know when they go into business, they're not going to go into business if they don't know how to sell, right? Oh, I, mean, I disagree with you. I completely disagree with you. That's the thing. I think that, honestly, people people go into business all the time without having any idea how to sell or if they, and this is, I'm, I'm talking a lot of, about creatives right now, they know how to do their creative part, but I don't know that they know how to sell. You know, and that's something that like having watched a lot of Zig Ziglar and, and done a lot of reading and a lot of research, I still don't really know how to sell. I'm very happy and lucky in that people tend to come to me when they want something. But as far as going to sell, I think I, I, I don't know. I'm honestly in no disrespect intended, Jim, but I honestly think there are a lot of people out there who don't have any idea how to do it. And that's why people like you can help, you know, <laughs> because you know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so point taken. So I was, I guess I was thinking in terms of my own backyard, the people, the people that I had met had survived a financial crisis and they were mm -hmm. still in business. I worked a lot in the aftermath of financial crisis. One was 2001 and the other one was 2008. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, they had survived that. So mm -hmm. they had some ability to sell, but but absolutely, one of the things that I help people with and help myself with as well is, I mean, I've been working on my sales conversation since I was delivering the Washington Post when I was 14 years old. I mean, I have been <laughs> working on it just nonstop. Right. And again, that was one of the major things that we worked on. Um, and what you're alluding to is that people, they know how to do the work. Mm -hmm. Like if you're a musician, you know how to play. If you're, hopefully, if you're a painter, you know how to paint. Um, but they they underestimate the marketing and the sales. But one thing for sure that, that nearly everyone underestimates is they're basically illiterate when it comes to numbers. Mm -hmm. And when you figure the, that when you look at your bank statement, what's there, right? It's, it's that the bank balance is a number. And so everything that leans into what that bank balance is, is a bunch of numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, is that you can get started in business based on really knowing what you're doing and whatever your, whatever your trade is or whatever your talent is. 
Um, and so what most people do is they get started and they just make decisions by intuition, which when you're relatively small and things are fairly uncomplicated, that, that works okay mm -hmm. um, until it doesn't. Right. You get to a certain level of complicate a certain level of complexity, the decisions start getting bigger dollar values involved, mm -hmm. like my thirty-two thousand dollar decision to buy that pavilion visualizer. And your your um and so your instincts don't serve you anymore. And so you really there's a much higher level need of information. Now again, for me to go, like I want to go to Switzerland, right? So um, you know, I don't need to become fluent in French to go to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they speak a couple of other languages. Over German. It's yeah. German. They so I don't need to be fluent in a foreign language, just like I have a nephew in special forces. You know, I think their goal is to try to get to like fifth grade or I'm sorry, five years old mm -hmm. is where they start at so that they can converse somewhat, mm -hmm. not to be fluent. So when they go to language school, they just want to be able to converse. And so um, as a business owner, you really, you don't have to be an expert in finance and numbers, but you do need to be able to converse. Does that make sense? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. If you want to survive, if you want to yeah. survive but at some point you get to, at some point, something happens to every business owner that makes it that they realize that it's just, sometimes they don't, sometimes they make it and sometimes they don't. Okay. I love that because it it's sort of here's the thing i i personally part of it might be that english isn't my first language i look at profit whatever all of those all of the numbers i look at all of that i look at what it all means and it's very confusing because it's it's almost never consistent across the line what mm -hmm. something means and one place is is it's called by another name in another place so what i'm hearing you say is that it works by intuition, uh, and I'm a small business, I'm a single person business, it works by intuition up to a point, and then you have to sort of almost get serious and, and become a five-year-old in the language. So what would you recommend for someone who's going, okay, I'm ready to get serious, I'm ready to take my business to the next level, I might want to hire an assistant in the next year, I want to maybe double my business, whatever, whatever the goals are, what do you recommend as the next best step once you're ready to not just be intuitive about it anymore what's the first step you should take so there's a you know going back to my analogy of going to switzerland like with my wife and i've actually talked about this and we also talked about going well ireland's not a good example because they speak sort of english there. <laughs> um, <laughs> they um, on the west coast they speak Gaeltach, but but uh yeah. they speak english most places yeah Anyway, when we go to Europe, we're going to hire a guide. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the answer. So um, we're, we're, we don't have the date set, but we're going to be launching profit speak soon. And so it's a very low risk, low cost way to get started to learn the language. And the really cool thing about it is that you don't need to know the language for every business out there. That's really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm at that level. Like I could walk into pretty much any business mm -hmm. in a couple of days, I can get a, a very good handle on the numbers. So, but you don't, you don't have to, the a business owner doesn't have to do that. Um, you can get a handle on your numbers relatively quickly um, in a, in a group environment. Um, if you're, if the stakes are higher and you have a, you know, somebody has got 20, 25 employees and they're, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of the time there's a lot of money laying around that there's a lot of waste and a lot of opportunity there, then it might make sense to have someone like myself come in um, face to face and work directly with your people. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, these days it's more virtual, uh, actually have me look, you know, spend some time looking at your financials, talking to your people, so on and so forth. But a lot of, a lot of folks just doing that, um, just a uh, five session, um, you know, using some tools, working with just their numbers, talking to some other business owners, talking to me in a, just over a 10 week period. Uh, you know, and it's a great time because, you know, you don't have to have everything mapped out for the year ahead of time. 
you know, by the end of February, the end of March, they could have a very solid plan to be able to make much, much better decisions moving forward. And not only that, but to really be able to fire themselves up and fire their team up with Mm -hmm. the promise of what's really uh, not only possible, but likely if they know where to focus. So that's a big, big subject. Um, There's been books written about it is knowing where to focus is super, super critical. So we not only talk about numbers, but um, like one of my favorite books out there um, that I used to teach a lot is The Goal by Ellie Goldratt. And so he came up with something called the theory of constraints. And just the summary of that is like, where do you need to focus your time and your energy and your efforts to get the biggest result? And so that's what the theory of constraints is all about. What, uh, what business owners do almost without fail is they have so many priorities, they have no priorities. They're working on getting more sales. They're working on getting more workout. They've got to do something over here with the accounting. They've got to talk to their insurance guy. They've got to talk to their attorney. They've got to put fires out with their customer. They're doing all this stuff. And they, they're, they're doing a lot of different things to try to improve in a lot of different areas. Um, but they don't know where that real leverage point is. And that's where, again, with a $1, $2 million business or even a $500,000 business, that's where it's just absolutely essential to know where that leverage point is. Okay. Most of what you said, uh, I got, I understood the thing that I, that I don't, it sounds to me like you're, when you're talking about helping people figure out the focus of what they're, of what they're doing, you need to develop some sort of a plan, right? Is that, is that part of what a business owner should do like i'm going to focus on cutting costs that's what my focus is and then once i've dealt with that i'm going to focus on uh the processes in my business and once i'm done doing that i'm going to focus on the gross profit or 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 is there some other way like what is what is the proper way once you choose a focus and and it sounds like you and when you work with people you help them choose a focus but once you choose a focus and you've done that what what happens next Yeah. So that the, I think the crux of your question is that that happens working together Mm -hmm. is as you start to learn your numbers and you start to use your numbers to know where those focus areas on. So it changes. So Mm -hmm. you open a bottleneck up in one area. So for instance, I work with a shed company, their bottleneck was clearly production. Okay. So we opened that area up and then, um, and, and we did that relatively quickly they had their scheduling board on something the size of a desk calendar. And so when we opened that up and got more intentional, intentional about the production, they were able to get a lot more production done just by basically giving it more thought, paying more attention to it. And so then we changed the focus over to sales. Mm -hmm. And so we started bringing more sales in. And so again, that was another incidence with that shed company I worked with that they from 2019 to 2020, they actually doubled their profits. And so the process that I go through is it's basically three steps. And so the first step is to gather, is to gather information. Mm -hmm. So some of that information is numbers. Some of that information is just watching and observing what's going on. Some of that information comes out of conversation. It could have to do with relationships. It can have to do with behavior. It can have to do with attitudes. It can have to do with belief systems. It can have to do with a lot of different things. So gathering, uh, gathering information, the second step. So that's G the second step is analyze. And so by analyzing that information, you can, um, really drill in and find out where your bottleneck or constraint is. Mm -hmm. And so the last is prioritize. So it's G A P gather, analyze and prioritize. So when you analyze you're you're putting numbers, to the different opportunities for improvement. You come up with your op- your missed opportunities and your problems and you get all those outlined. And then the third step is you prioritize. And so you prioritize where you're gonna get your biggest bang for the buck, which is gonna be wherever your bottleneck is. 
So that's where you would start. Yeah, you start with your bottleneck, and then once you fix that bottleneck, that bo- the the bottleneck moves or the constraint. It's those two terms are are used pretty much interchangeably. The constraint changes. The so thing within that's a production causing the line, problem. Is yes, that what you're talking yes. about? Okay, so okay, in a production uh-huh. line, mm-hmm. it can move from one place in the production line to another place in the production line. Or within the business, it can move from production to where production is getting caught up. So the sales backlog, the orders that are sold but not yet complete, the sales backlog is now going down. And so the constraint within the business is now sales. We have to go out and create more sales. And then another potential constraint is cash. And so sometimes you can go out and get a lot more sales and depending upon some different issues within the business, then the cash can get short where they're having a hard time getting the work out, which is then, you know, causing even more cash problems. And so there's a, you know, we have a cash management process that we use to help people get through that, Mm -hmm. that issue and get that back opened up again. Um, So it goes between, and this is where the plan comes in. You need a, like a two, three page plan, no more than that. And you need to look at sales, operations, and finance. Just very, very simple. No more complicated than that. And to have a plan for sales, how you're going to get work, how you're going to do work, and then how you're going to keep score. Get work, do work, keep score. That it sounds simple enough, even though. I'm sure that there are a lot of people who would be listening to this who'd be going, yeah, right. Like I could figure all that out. And, and if, if, if you are, if you are a person who's an entrepreneur or a small business owner and you're, you're looking for the constraint or the bottleneck, but I guess the question is, what if you're getting by, you know, what if you're okay? What if you're, what if you know your numbers and you're okay, but you want to grow what you're doing into something bigger? How would you approach that? If somebody came to you and said, look, I'm doing okay, but I feel like I want to grow and I feel like I know my numbers. Is there something else I could be doing? And if so, what is it? What do you think? Yeah, about so that? I think pretty much any business owner, another set of eyes is going to help. Uh huh. Um, I mean, I've, I've yet to find a business that I could go into that I couldn't find money. And if all I do is validate like, Hey man, you got it nailed. I mean, that has value. That Mm -hmm. hasn't, that hasn't happened with me yet. There's (laughs) always, there's always money there. And in fact, um, it's, it, it, and again, this is a hypothetical question, right? Um, in fact, if somebody, the more, the more capability somebody has many times, the bigger the potential opportunity can be to open things up. Mm-hmm. It's even within a team. So to be really successful, to be, to have your success optimized means that you have to have a team, right? So a solopreneur is not going to be optimized. Mm-hmm. Like the, you know, one of the biggest steps for a solopreneur to take is to get a virtual assistant. Right. Right. And so, you know, that's a relatively simple business. And, and even there, there's, there's, always opportunities to optimize. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it it seems to me like I'm looking for a virtual assistant now and and looking for someone who understands what you're trying to do, is excited about what you're trying to do and has the skills that you need in order to help you grow is a, you know, I need to, I need to get Chelsea Brinkley on here so we can talk about that because I think it's such an important topic, especially Mm -hmm. for creatives, you know, but Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing that I wanted to ask you is, Within that, within like this person needs to grow or they want to grow even, they want to grow their business, they have a virtual assistant or they don't, that part's not the the issue here. But, but I'm wondering about resistance. How often do you walk into a place and somebody asks for your help, right? They said, I want to hire you to help me with this and I want to grow my business. How often do you meet resistance from the people who actually said they wanted your help and what do you do about it? Yeah, so it would actually be the exception that there would that there would not be resistance. Really? So the situations that I walked into, again, this is it's not so much anymore because my business model uh, doing consulting on my own is a lot softer on the clients than when I was an, an employee. But people are scared, and they're also uh, a little embarrassed. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Cause nobody, I mean, again, you know, going back to me in the Mexican restaurant, like I'm embarrassed to say, you know, gracias, because like, that's as far as it goes, you know, I, I'm, it, it's embarrassing. Oh, and I'm so sorry here it is. That. I have, <laughs> here it is. I have a business and, um, and, um, and, uh, you know, I'm struggling somewhat or, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying some financial success, but I want to do better. And I know I can do better anyway. Yeah. So it's really very rare that there's not some kind of resistance. And mm-hmm. so again, what we do to, to overcome that is, and, and I've done this over and over and over again is um, we get started and we gather some information and we come up with a plan. But one of the first things that we do is we find out what that biggest opportunity is. And when they see that there's, a, they're leaving a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars on the table with one opportunity, then that resistance goes away. Mm. Okay, so, so it's the promise of what they could get to that helps people overcome what, how they're resisting, or what they're resisting. Yeah, so people are frustrated. I mean, it's 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 hard to run a business and you know, not have the right skills and knowledge that you need in every area. I mean, no, one person doesn't know it all. And, and where do you, you know, where do you go to even learn this stuff? Right. It's seriously. There, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I actually bought the book. Um, You know, I bought the book finance for non-financial managers in the, in the table of contents is like eight pages. Like my clients are not going to read that book. And even if they did, it's not going to help them. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a challenging area, but, um, you know, going back to, well, I'll tell you just a quick story about this truck repair company I worked with. He, he was, he was scared to death. He, he, uh, he had just built a new building and I think he signed a note for like $2 million and he wasn't sleeping. He was getting up, going to work at like four o'clock in the morning. And, um, you know, he wasn't sleeping anyway. I mean, he yelled at his, his operations manager for not making the coffee, you know, like right in front of us. I mean, this guy was on edge and, um, and turned out he was scared to death about being able to pay for this new building that he built. Right. uh, On top of not sleeping. And so it took us a few days, but we realized that there's an opportunity there. He wasn't billing for the guy's time. He had six techs. They were working 40 hours a week. Mm Mm-hmm. And he was only billing for 53% of their time, we found out. And then also he discovered the solution. So we, in a meeting in his conference room, talked about, well, all you have to do is X, is get more information from the techs on each one and and increase your billing. And there was like two, $300,000 a year, just just right there. That's so he was he was thing. excited. Yeah, he was really excited. So he went from being really, really angry, super. And this guy's a little scary, too. He was Olympic Olympic weightlifter. Oh, wow. So he's kind of intimidating. He kind of scared right. me one time. He kind of snapped me one time. Yeah, he scared me a little. So, um, yeah, so he was excited, you know, after after a couple of days, he was a little nervous in the, the second day. You know, we showed him the plan. He was a little nervous. But, um, you know, once we got through that first exercise and he started looking at The key is his numbers, like going to class is boring. And so that's, what's cool about the workshop that we have is that, you know, I'll engage with you as much as you'll engage with me. If you want to share your numbers with me, we don't have to share them with the whole group. You can share your numbers with me and you'll get some information back and you'll get to know your numbers. You don't have to know, you know, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be fluent, but if you can just get a basic working knowledge of your own numbers, um, you know, I promise you that there is money there that you had no idea was there. That's a beautiful thing to hear. I'm sure <laughs> I I'm, I'm curious about something. First of all, I would love to know how, if somebody's going, yeah, I have a business and I'd love to know more about this workshop. Where, where does someone find that information? Where, where is profit speak? Where would you, where will actually, by the time this episode airs, it's, uh, sometime in, late January, early February. So, Perfect. so where, where is profit, profit speak right now? If I want to go, Hey, I want to sign up. Where is it? Yeah. So go to Jim Adams, consulting.com. There's some, some free stuff there. You can sign up to get some of our templates. You can sign up for our newsletter. 
you can call me or email me and um, we don't have it scheduled yet. So you get on our mailing list and we would, uh, we would let you know when that's going to be, it's going to be less than, less than $500. And, uh, and that's going to include um, a couple of 30 minute, um, 30 minute coaching calls. We really just want to get to know you and your business and get, get you some value. And, uh, and then again, you can go there and uh, we've got a business model template that you can download there for free. Um, that's not going to apply to every business, but at least it gives you an idea of what a, uh, you know, what a business model template looks like. You just have to get um, five, six numbers together off your, in, off of your tax return. And, uh, you know, to give you a picture of, of where you're starting and then also to give us a place for us to start a conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I appreciate you saying that because if somebody wants to at least begin to look at their numbers, it sounds like that template is a good place to begin provided they have their tax returns and can find that information. Uh, some people don't, some people have a lot of trouble with that. So if you're, if you're one of the people who has trouble with that, maybe we can start some sort of a support group because I do, I also have trouble with that. Uh, I, I did want to ask you something, uh, about the, the guy with the trucking company and, that is this when he went okay I have to bill for all of their time right so instead of 53 percent all of a sudden it was going to be a hundred percent of these of these texts time he all of a sudden was almost doubling what he was charging his customers am I am I right in that if if he starts all of a sudden billing for their time in this way how did how did you do how do you recommend someone does that like oh I'm raising my rates you know, I'm, I'm a consultant and I'm raising my rates or I'm, I have a business and all of a sudden what you were paying $53,000 a year for is now going to be $100,000 a year because I'm going to be charging for these people's time that I haven't been charging for. What, what would you recommend someone who has a business do to get their customers on board with something like that? Because it seems kind of sudden to me and personally I'd be like, wait, what? You're charging me more? Why? What happened? Okay, so there's two questions there. One was a specific instance, and I'll start off with that first. So mm -hmm. what what it was is that the techs were not putting enough information down on the work order for him to basically be able to tell the story to the client to justify that they had spent five, six hours working on that vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so they were only charging like three hours when they should have been when he was working on it for six. Mm-hmm and should have been charging for six. Mm -hmm. So as long as the client knew what it was that they were doing, then they would, they wouldn't question it mm -hmm. and, and they did it. So, so that actually happened. He actually did. He didn't go to hundred percent, but he got up to, uh, to 80% by being more thorough with the billing. Mm -hmm. But now the second question is uh, about the elasticity uh, in, in the pricing. And so like that would be a subject for a session. So, uh, because there's, there's different things involved in that. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, one thing is your messaging. So the messaging and your branding and things like that, how is the value of what you do coming across to your customer? Um, how is it being aimed at what their exact needs are? Do you even know what their needs are? Things like that. Um, your sales conversation is another part of it. So if you have a lame sales conversation or your salespeople are out there on their milk run and they're not you know, not really getting new customers. The other thing is the, the quality of the customers that you have. A lot of businesses need to fire some customers and go out and get some new customers. There's a lot of variables that go into that mm -hmm. um, as far as um, being able to um, Im improve your margins, basically. So it sounds like it's individualized. What What you might need to be looking at in that arena is very unique to you and your business. Yeah. And so that's, what's really awesome about the whole process is, is how individual, individualized it is. What I would mm -hmm. warn people about, um, and I'm still looking for a way to, to tackle this is like trying to educate yourself on the subject of finance and numbers in general, it's kind of tough because there's so many different types of businesses. And then every, you know, every individual, like every heating and air, business is a little bit different. There's similarities, but each one is different. There's different people, there's different strengths. There's, you know, every business is different. Uh -huh. And 
And so, but that's the, I mean, that's the real beauty of it is that you can take, you know, you can take your strengths and you can identify your weaknesses and really create, you know, make your business and create a business that's just so much more than it is right now. I love the way you said that. And it's interesting because it, what I keep coming back to, I keep coming back to a couple of different words that I, I think you're, you're, you're pinging on for me, which are self-awareness, self-knowledge and courage, because you need to be, you need to know yourself and what you're capable of and what your business is and what your business does and what it could do almost objectively you can't lie to yourself if you're going to grow your business it sounds like what do you think about that what do you think about the idea of radical honesty with yourself when it comes to this stuff well i'll take it a step further than that and that is is because i would i mean again i was guilty of this and um and that is is, is to take the time to think how are you going to make some white space in your calendar to give yourself time to think and solve problems. Mm -hmm. So I've like taken that to a whole other level. I've got a tool that I use now. And so, um, Jim, sorry. Oh, that's okay. I, I had, I did you had, mute uh, yourself? I did. I did. So, um, <laughs> so the last thing that came through was I've got a tool that I use now. Yes. Yeah. So I use Trello. And so that keeps me organized. Mm. And so when I go to bed, I know like 545 the next morning, like, for example, this morning, I knew that there was this landing page that I needed to work on. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a new landing page created for the upcoming year to test out. And so I knew that I had to do a revision on that. I had to write some copy. I have to go research some pictures. So that was my task because I know I'm not going to do that very well with the phone ringing and people knocking on my door, interrupting me and things like that. So to have time to think mm -hmm. is that no more than you would, you know, you're not going to try to make one of your beautiful paintings with all these distractions or, I mean, maybe you would, I don't know, but it seems to me like you would take some time to really imagine like, what is it that you're even going to paint? Oh, absolutely. I think any creative of any sort. And I think a lot of what you're talking about, honestly, is is in that same place of, of being agile and being adaptable. And that's what I think about creativity in general, is that it lets us be agile, adaptable and, and flexible. And that that notion of taking time for yourself to envision, to plan, to systematize those things that you're talking about it's just as important for a creative person versus someone who isn't using the their powers of creativity in the moment but it's still really important i and i see that very much what you're talking about we have to take that time the question is i guess there's a psychology at work here and my question to you is how do you prioritize that for yourself what are you doing what what are you jim adams doing to prioritize that thinking time? How do you set aside all the other demands on your time and your energy? So there's a couple things at play. First of all, all entrepreneurs are creatives. Absolutely. Whether they realize it or not. Okay. The most successful entrepreneurs are creatives. I mean, even if you think about Bill Gates, like the most brilliant thing he ever did is, you know, he didn't even create DOS. He just saw the need for it and put the two things together and boom, Microsoft happened, right? So we're all, we're all creatives. Absolutely. So the second part of it is the reason I know what to work on is numbers. And I have a specific example. So I have a vision and, a, and I'm about halfway through creating a brand new 56 page catalog. Okay. That is on hold right now. And the reason why it's on hold is because I know my numbers and I know from experience and I know from numbers and I know from tracking that that catalog has a lot less leverage than the two new salespeople that I just hired that I'm going to be training in the next 10 weeks. Okay. And also 
that that landing page that I just talked to you about has a lot more potential to feed those new sales reps and to get them more leads than that catalog. That catalog, maybe that's like more of an ego thing, like it would feel really good to get that completed. But when it comes right down to it, like I could just take the form off the website for the catalog and it really, really wouldn't make that big of a difference. We've got an online version that is fine for most people. We could just quit mailing out catalogs. But I know that from information. That's not, that's not my gut telling me that. I know that from tracking information and seeing people that have actually bought structures and which of them got catalogs and which of them didn't. Again, it's about knowing your numbers. I, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, the more, the more I talk to you, Jim, the more I'm like, okay, I need to go figure out my numbers. And, and I well, agree and with you. Go ahead, it's go not ahead. just numbers. It's not just numbers. It's numbers. It's also information. Numbers is like a little sterile. And then people are afraid of math. I'm no good at math, all that kind of stuff. It's information. Okay. And, and what to do with it. Yeah, and and it's information that you have to be honest with yourself about, and that that brings me back to that 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 thought earlier about radical honesty about what you're doing and about what you're trying to achieve. And I think that yeah, I agree with you completely. And I also wanted to just say, I'm so grateful that you said that you believe everyone's creative. That is so wonderful. All entrepreneurs are creative, and I think many of us who aren't entrepreneurs are also creative. We all have our own unique creative genius, and I'm thrilled that that you said that because I think it's super important. I I did want to ask you this idea of information. A lot of us are afraid, right? A lot of us are afraid of digging down and finding out what's actually going on. You know, there's a little bit of a la 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 la, I can't see it, I can't hear it, la 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 la. What if someone is not at a place, you know, they don't have a, a $500,000 business or a million dollar business or whatever, and they're not ready to go to profit speak with you. What could they do to, to start, you know, stopping the la 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 and to start really being honest with themselves about, about that information? What, what, what would you say? Okay. You're not ready for profit speak. You're not ready to work with me yet, but let me give you some advice on what to start with. What would you say to someone like that? Um, the thought that comes to mind is that sounds kind of like a personal growth matter, mm -hmm. you know, based on my own personal experience is to, um, if you broaden out what you're thinking, and then if you take the time to think the resources that you need will come to you. And mm -hmm. it's not because some of the things that you're talking about, there's lots of different resources out there. And so the question that you ask is, uh, and I'm stealing this from Tony Robbins, is it's a resourcefulness issue. Mm -hmm. Is that if you really want to be an entrepreneur um, or you really want to have a great life, one of the biggest keys is being resourceful. And so if you're taking that time for yourself and you're working on your growth and you're resourceful, then the right resources will come to you and you will create what you need. And so that could come in many forms. Like I've been exposed to many teachers since this more recent growth st journey started. And so, um, you know, when you, when you open yourself up, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I, I agree with you <laughs> in principle. Absolutely. It, it's just, you know, as, as I, I work, a lot with companies who are looking to innovate that's that's when i go to a company to speak or to run one of my workshops it's because they want to be more agile and more adaptable and, and they want to innovate and so i'm i'm looking at that perspective right the perspective of we need to be receptive to all sorts of ideas and all sorts of ways of thinking and the the perspective that you're advocating and correct me if i'm wrong is that all of that is well and good and you still need to have the the bottom line information and so i'm i love that this other perspective is you you make it accessible you know and i think that i'm so grateful to you for making it so accessible over this last hour that we've been chatting because i know a lot of people who are scared about it i know a lot of people who are nervous about looking at those numbers because either they won't like what they see or that the numbers will swim in front of their faces and they won't make any sense so i'm I want to say thank you for for 
being part of this conversation and bringing so much, so much value. And I also would love it if you would give uh, the rest of your, you had a bunch of different social media things. Uh, I know jimadamsconsulting.com. So if, if you're listening and you want to know more about Jim Adams and the work that he's doing to help businesses thrive, you should go there. And there's also the, the business model template. And that is jimadamsconsulting.com slash B-O-E. And then I'd love it if you could give LinkedIn, if somebody wants to connect with you there, and also Facebook, if somebody wants to find you there so that, so that people can follow you and your new big fans can get to know more about the work you're doing to help businesses. Oh, as far as exactly what my links are? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have those at my fingertips. <laughs> That's okay. You know what? You're thinking bigger picture and I like that. So what I'll do then is I'll put those in the show notes mm -hmm. and, and that way, uh, that way we'll, we'll have, you'll have the access to that. And also I'm going to mention the books that you mentioned and the people that you mentioned, like Tony Robbins, like, uh, thinking Napoleon Hills, think and grow rich, all of those different books, which are, which are really good as far as opening up your mindset. I think if you, if you want to think differently about yourself and about your business and about your ability to, to tame your business and grow your business, those books are, are great places to start. So Jim, I, I, I was going to ask you this one thing. Is there anything else that you think that someone should know about this topic that we haven't covered? Uh, as far as information and business, um, let's say one thing um, I would just, I would just summarize by saying this is that this subject more than any other, and it's why I chose, like, I mean, I've, I've sold a lot of product in my lifetime and I've spent a lot of time helping people get more work out. And one of the reasons why I chose to highlight numbers is because of just how incredibly difficult it is to, to sort out for a business owner, mm -hmm. um, just every business owner that I met going all the way back to 1999, um, just the, their eyes glaze over when you start talking numbers mm -hmm. and it's intimidating and scary. And it's been made to be that way. The, you know, the way financial statements are formatted and everything for taxes is very confusing. It doesn't serve businesses very well. And so uh, just being able to find a way to sort through, to just chunk down as simple as possible, your numbers, it doesn't have to be that scary. You're, you're not alone, basically, is, I guess is what I want to say. You're not alone. Almost every entrepreneur faces this and gets to the point that, that, that they have to do something about it and just, uh, you know, get, if it's not me, get somebody else to guide you through your numbers. Cause it's important. It's important to know them and be honest with yourself about them. I'm it's so true. I agree with you a hundred percent and uh, you you've inspired me to look at my own numbers for, <laughs> for the coming year. I will no longer hide my head in the sand. Jim, again, I want to, <laughs> I want to thank you so much for, for joining me. I have a question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. Mm -hmm. It's a silly question, but I find that it, it yields some poignant answers. And the question is this, if you had a plane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Wow. No warning, huh? Nope. First okay. thing that comes to mind. I would just say, know your numbers. There you go. I'd like to come up with something more <laughs> profound and meaningful and, and heartfelt than that. But uh, that's what comes to mind. You know, and, and, and that's the thing is if we talk about that and cause know your numbers, it's poignant and it's simple and it's, and it is to the point because if you know that there's a lot of comfort in it, even, even if it's a little scary as you're going through it, I imagine that there is comfort in knowing where you stand. You know, I, I to me, there's something really powerful about that. I, I talk about that with rock bottom, People think of rock bottom as a bad thing. I actually think of rock bottom as a good thing because you may have been falling and falling and falling on unstable ground, but for the first time when you hit rock bottom, you're standing on a stable foundation. And so even if you're afraid of your numbers, it sounds like, my goodness, knowing what they are gives you that firm foundation on which you can build. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it can be scary to know where you are, 
but it's not like you have no idea. I mean, you know what your bank balance is, but what's really, really exciting is what it could be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's the point is that where you are is not where you're going to stay. And if Jim's around to help you, then you're going to be able to grow. And I think that's really cool. So Jim, once again, thank you so much for being here. I could talk with you for the next six hours, but I know you have a life <laughs> to get back to. Yeah. Uh, and, and the next travel thing to plan in your RV. We didn't even talk about your traveling. I'm so sorry we didn't get a chance to do that because I'm a huge traveler myself. But maybe you'll come back again and we'll talk a little bit more about what it's like to work while you're on the road. Until yeah, then, that would though, be fun. yeah, it would be. I'd love to have you back. Uh, until then, though, Jim, thank you once again. And if you have enjoyed this episode of the Innovative Mindset Podcast, you got to let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can leave a review where you listen or you can comment on the show notes. Let me know what you're thinking. If you want to get in touch with Jim, you now know how to do that from jimadamsconsulting.com. Until next time, next week, we're going to be talking about some really cool stuff about uh, creatives and burnout and what it means if you are a creative with burnout and how you can use creativity to get through burnout. It's going to be a chock full episode and it's going to be me solo. I don't have a, an interview next week. But, uh, but I think it'll be really interesting for you to listen to. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg, once again for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.